Before we can really begin to understand which fossils represent the earliest hominin, we need to have a sense, or it helps at least to have a sense, of when we're likely to expect to find those early hominin fossils. What's the right time period to look for? What are the right sediments to look in given their age? It turns out genetics provides a clue that allows us to begin to estimate when we would expect to find the earliest hominin, or at the very least provides evidence that allows us to test independently whether or not something might be a viable hominin. The basis for this comes from something known as the molecular clock. This was an observation actually first established in the 1960s when geneticists began to look at changes in protein structures across different species groups. So back at the time, they might look at a variety of species, for example, humans, dogs, pigs, chickens, separated by large amounts of evolutionary time, and look at actually related protein structures in these different species. And what they began to observe was that if you calibrated how far apart these organisms were in terms of the fossil record, how far apart they shared common ancestors, they began to have certain kinds of amounts of protein difference, basically. And it turned out there was a fairly tight correlation between how long in the past organisms were separated and how different their proteins were. Almost a linear relationship, in fact such that it appeared as if the differences in these protein structures were accumulating at a near constant rate through time. This observation established the molecular clock. Now there are a number of important implications from this observation. The first is that many of the genetic mutations that accumulate over time within us, in this case the changes in the protein structures that these researchers were observing, don't have strong evolutionary effects in the sense that natural selection is not acting upon them. In other words, if they're accumulating at a constant rate over time, they're relatively neutral with respect to evolutionary change, or at least with natural selection. This formed the basis of what we know as the neutral theory of evolution, which is that most of the changes within our genome don't produce phenotypic results and aren't subject, therefore, to natural selection. So this Neutral evolution explains the fact that there's a near constant accumulation in protein changes across these groups over time. However, there's another observation we can take from this as well, which is that if changes are accumulating at a near constant rate, if we can directly go in and measure actually how different two organisms are, we might be able to then infer how long in the past they shared a common ancestor. And indeed, this is what people have done with actually humans and the great apes. So, for example, if we look at the relationship between the genus Homo, us, and the genus Pan, which includes chimpanzees and gorillas, we can compare genetically how different these two species are. The amount of genetic difference, given a certain near constant accumulation of neutral mutations, can then allow us to estimate how far back in the past we would expect to find that last common ancestor. So the accumulation of mutations over time, if it occurs at a relatively constant rate, will give us a fairly good indirect marker as to how long in the past there was a last common ancestor between these two species. Now, the current understanding of this relationship is that that last common ancestor was something on the order of five to seven million years in the past. Meaning that if we wanted to find evidence for the earliest hominin, the kind of sediments we'd want to look in are ones that are dated to this time period. In the last two decades, as we'll see this week, there's been a lot of discoveries from sediments coming from just this time period that have been argued to be the earliest hominin specimens, the earliest divergence of humans away from the lineage including apes. Now there are a couple of factors we need to keep in mind that make this a little bit more complex than it sounds. First of all, as it turns out, the rate of accumulation of mutations over time, the rate of genetic change over time, is not entirely constant. It varies actually across different lineages, which might have to do with a number of factors, including life history factors, how long lineages or how long generations last within individual lineages, and now there are other external factors, such as where geographically lineages have been evolving. In the case of humans and great apes, for example, because humans and great apes tend to live a long time, there's a fairly long intergenerational period, the rate of accumulation of genetic traits or new genetic mutations in humans and great apes is relatively slow. So the pace of the molecular clock for humans and great apes, we think, is relatively slow. There's another factor, however, that enters into this as well, which is the overall rate of mutation. That's an important component that allows us to again estimate these divergence times. Now, until very recently, we had to indirectly estimate the rate of mutation across 
individuals and across generations by looking again at how far in the past individuals shared a common ancestor and estimating then how much, how long it would have taken or what rate of mutation would have created the amount of difference that we see between them. With the rise of genomics, however, the ability to sample entire genomes, we've developed a new tool to allow us to directly estimate mutation rate. By looking at actually how many differences accumulate between an individual and that individual's parents, by looking at the genomes of that triad, offspring, and parents, we can actually directly estimate rates of mutation. Now, as it turns out, these directly estimated rates of mutation have been much slower than the rates of mutation that we've estimated indirectly from the past. So at the moment, actually, there's some degree of uncertainty as to exactly how to calibrate our molecular clock in humans, whether or not to use these new mutation rates, which seem very rapid, or the old mutation rates, which seem slower in the past. But in general, we're going to think of the last common ancestors occurring within this five to seven million year period. But I just want you to keep in mind that this is an area of a lot of active research, but that this has important implications for how we think about the origin of hominins.